What's happening, everybody? Some new rule changes proposed for college football. What are they? Locked on SEC starts right now. You are locked on SEC, your daily podcast on the Southeastern Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And what's up, everybody? Welcome to Locked On SEC. It's great to have you guys along. This episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Go check them out today at NissanUSA.com. I'm Chris Gordy. Thanks for making Locked On SEC your first listen every day. Shout out to every dayers. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, covering your team every day. All right, we got plenty to discuss. We'll get into recapping the weekend that was in SEC basketball, SEC baseball, NFL Combine, all that. But we got to start first with the news coming out that uh, the NCAA on Friday announcing a series of recommended rule changes. So let's dive into this as the NCAA recommended rule changes, including a two-minute warning at the end of each half, tablets on the sideline, and the allowance of player-to-coach helmet communication for all FBS programs. So these are rules that have been applied in the NFL, but college football uh, has been a little bit behind, particularly with when it comes to in-helmet audio. So we'll get to that in just a second. But the uh, Friday recommendations still need to be approved by the NCAA Playing Rules Oversight Panel. They will meet uh, a little over a month on April 18th. But these recommendations are eventually expected to be adopted. So what will be the impact in the immediate future of some of these potential rule changes? Well, let's start with the two-minute warning. That's right. You heard me right. It's been happening in the NFL forever. The two-minute warning going to come to college football. Going to make comebacks a lot easier. Uh, comebacks became a little bit harder this past offseason with that rule change that eliminated clock stoppages after first downs, with the exception of the final two minutes of each half. I will say that was one I was a little concerned about, but you you didn't really notice it in a lot of games. The only times you noticed it, if you were down, say, like 10 with six minutes to go and you kicked off to the other team and – you know, the other team could keep just keep that clock moving uh, without having to, you know, really get a, you know, first down. Like, so it, again, it wasn't like a, it wasn't overwhelming, like, oh my God, that was a bad rule change. But anyway, uh, the NCAA is making it a little bit easier with the addition of a two minute warning because you will get an automatic clock stoppage. It's in the NFL, it's like an extra timeout, right? Uh, but the rule change is going to bring college football regulations more in line with the NFL, create a stoppage at the two-minute mark at the end of each half, and it could be big four teams going for a last-minute drive. Free timeout. Clock still stops after each first down also under two minutes, and the final two minutes of each half, each half could last a long time. I mean, if you got three timeouts left and the two-minute warning and the clock stopping after first downs, it's going to take a while to get to halftime, but uh, we could see more late lead changes with this shift. Uh, two minute warning that, you know, my immediate reaction, I tweeted this out guaranteed TV timeout for next work for networks, more ad revenue, more ad time, more commercials. And if you're a fan, uh, more bathroom breaks or run to the fridge for another beer, whatever it is you're doing. But um, nonetheless, two minute warning coming to college football. I've seen some people kind of mixed on it. I, I don't have a big problem with it. Uh, again, if it's going to give another team team a chance to make a team make a game close at the end of uh, regulation, um, could be interesting. All right, the other one here is the helmet communication. A huge common sense change, according to a lot of people. Uh, there was a lot of storylines this past season with Michigan's sign stealing scandal. Well, you don't longer have to hold up the, you know whiteboard of logos of Tony the Tiger and everything else, um, you know, with the concern that the other team's trying to steal your signals, 
college football will introduce the in-helmet communication. Going to eliminate much of the competitive advantage that came from si st uh, stealing signs because the call goes directly into the quarterback's ear. So coaches would have the ability to call the play directly to their quarterback's ear until an automated 15-second cutoff uh, mark of the play clock. The helmet communication on the field, and that player will be identified by having a green dot on the back of the helmet. Nick Saban said this back in October when he was the head coach of Alabama. He said, I do think the helmet communicator is a real positive for the game. You can't steal signs or do any of this stuff if you don't have a helmet communicator. I think it would be a good thing because it's worked out well in the NFL. So quarterbacks, you know, come so used to in college football, the, the quarterbacks look into the sideline. What's the call? What's the signal? They have to do that. They can line up, you know, with their team, be in the huddle, get in the, uh, get in the call in their ear. The shift will also allow teams to get play calls into their quarterback more quickly, which means more uh, fast-paced offenses moving a little bit quicker. I'm sure Lane Kiffin's a big fan of this. Ole Miss will move even faster. Um, but, yeah, look, it's they realize sign stealing was an issue, so they're kind of getting away with it or getting away from it. Uh, the NCAA, and this will be a way to do that. And then the other thing is tablets on the sidelines, again, how many times do we see Tom Brady, Josh Allen, Pat Mahomes? They're sitting on the sideline looking at the tablet to review the play. Uh, that just happened. They're going to have that for college football, most likely to be approved. So, again, these rules haven't been approved just yet, but expected to happen here in uh, the next month or so. And, again, expect to be adopted. Feels like we've had major changes every offseason in college football adopted, right? Um I don't know why we have to keep changing things. I, I assume we're doing a lot of this change for the better. But, uh, man, feels like we've had more change in the recent years of college football than any other year. All right. Let's get to a couple other tidbits going on around the conference. Uh, Trevor Etienne, former Florida running back, transferred to Georgia this offseason, expects to be a uh, big dog for Georgia in the backfield. And he appeared on the Real Talk podcast over the weekend. And some of his quotes went viral. Here's what he said. Um, he said, I wanted to play in December, too. That played a big part in me transferring. So I could stay and be running back number two on a losing team or go somewhere and be possibly be running back one and win a natty. Basically, ATN saying, you know, sharing a backfield with Florida, um, with Montreal Johnson in Florida, saying, uh, you know, being one of two running backs on a losing team, or I could go be – running back number one, and win a national championship. And obviously, Georgia is going to be in the mix to do that. They do lose their two top rushers this past year, Dejon Edwards and Kendall Milton. And no other skill player coming in has more than – or coming back from Georgia has more than 30 rushing attempts. Roderick Robinson, Andrew Paul, Cash Jones. Uh, they do bring in a, a stud recruiting class with a bunch of running backs, including Nate Frazier. But Trevor A-10 is going to be the guy. And expect him to carry that load, but obviously some Georgia or Florida fans aren't happy with uh, the shot he took. But hey, it's going to be interesting to see what what it looks like on the field. Carson Beck back there in Georgia. I mean, they're they're loaded once again, and they already have a an established SEC stud running back and Trevor Etienne coming in. Speaking of the Florida Gators, Billy Napier. Uh, two seasons haven't lived up to where he's maybe wanted to be, but heading into year three, he is um, assembling his staff and trying to get everything just right and turned some heads when he named two offensive line coaches to his inaugural Florida staff. He does not have an on-field quarterbacks coach with Ryan O'Hara serving in the traditional quarterback coach role, uh, but Rob Sale, who worked with Napier at Alabama, he returned to the college ranks as Florida's OC and O-line coach ahead of the 2022 season. And while Sale holds the title of offense coordinator, Napier has been Florida's offensive play caller. But in addition to Sale, Napier brought along Darnell Stapleton from Louisiana, where he had served as assistant offensive line coach. Stapleton's title at Florida was offensive line coach. Uh, in February, Stapleton was named assistant offensive line coach with the Washington Commanders. So his departure opened up. Uh, on Napier's on-field staff. And there was a lot of interest in where they were going to go. Well, 
24-7 Sports reporting that Jonathan DeCoster will be Florida's second offensive line coach. He will join the Gators after three seasons as assistant line coach with the Browns in the NFL. So uh, we will see how that works out. But uh, last month it was reported tight ends coach Russ Calloway had added the title of co-OC. And Billy Napier, man, big, big important year for him with the Florida Gators. One other note here, uh, Alabama picked up a big-time recruit over the weekend, flipping an in-state recruit away from Auburn. 2025 recruit, four-star defensive lineman Antonio Coleman out of Sarah Land High School. He was originally committed to Alabama in September, flipped to Auburn in December, and now he's back to committing to the Crimson Tide and Kalen DeBoer. He's six foot two, 285 pounds, number 15 defensive lineman in the country, and the number 122 player uh, in the nation. Coleman was Auburn's highest ranked commitment for Hugh Freeze's class as of the weekend. So his flip uh, will leave Auburn with eight hard commits. Uh, headlined by four-star edge, Ja'Caleb Falk. And there you have it. That is the latest news going on around the conference. When we come back, we'll give you some of the SEC guys who stood out at the uh, NFL Combine. That is coming your way here in just a second. Thank you guys for making Locked on SEC your first listen every day. First message from our friends over at Nissan. Look, are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? If you ever wondered... Uh, What a venture could be around the next corner. Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. And that starts with the 2024 Nissan Rogue. It is perfect for city drivers and great escapes. Class exclusive Google is built in. It is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store built right into that 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system and the 2024 rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure you might also be interested in the 2024 nissan armada it will change what you expect from a full-size suv picture a rugged four by four they can seat up to eight in first class luxury and style tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 armada take the nissan rogue nissan pathfinder or nissan armada and go find your next big adventure go shop them right now at nissanusa.com to find out more All right, continue on here. Locked on SEC. Thank you guys for making us your first listen every day. Shout out to our everydayers. Come on back tomorrow on the show. we got plenty of stuff planned for you throughout this week. Getting you uh, started into spring ball. A lot of SEC schools getting hitting the practice field down. We'll be getting some takeaways from some of our other locked on hosts. Some of the big takeaways with the start of spring ball. All right, the NFL Combine was over the weekend, and a lot of SEC guys – Standing out in that one, so figured we hit on some of the guys who had some of the big uh, performances over the weekend and grabbed people's eyes. So jumping right into it, uh, we start with a couple guys who aren't in the SEC just yet um, and won't play in the SEC, but their school's heading to the SEC. Texas Longhorns uh, wide receiver Xavier Worthy clocked a record-setting 40-yard dash, uh, the fastest 40-yard time of the combine ran a blazing 421 on his second attempt after posting a 425 on his first run uh, in a 40 yard dash. Uh, he also shined in the jumps with a 41 inch vertical, a 10 foot 11 broad, measured 5 foot 11, 165 pounds. He's rated as a four star prospect coming out of uh, high school and number 13 wide receiver. And man, he certainly impressed. We talked with him and AD Mitchell both at the uh, prior to the Sugar Bowl down in New Orleans. and Two guys that certainly have uh, climbed up some draft boards here with those performances over the weekend. A.D. Mitchell also, six foot two, 205 pounds, started his career at Georgia, finished at Texas, but he posted a 4 3 4 40 time and a 39 and a half inch vertical, an 11 foot four broad jump. So uh, both those guys, very impressive over the weekend. Guys who did play in the SEC, how about Tennessee running back Jalen Wright? Posted the second fastest 40 yard time of those in his position group, clocked a 438 on Saturday. His 11 foot two broad jump topped all running backs, and his 38 inch vertical ranked fourth 
And Jalen Wright comes into this draft as one of the top running back prospects in the country. Now, you know, is that a lot to be a second round pick? Feels like it. A lot of the mock drafts I've seen have Jalen Wright going in the second round. So we'll keep an eye on him. He averaged 6.7 yards per carry in the last two seasons with the Tennessee Volunteers. Another guy who helped his stock, Alabama edge Dallas Turner. He came into the week as the top edge defender in the class. And he proved worthy of those projections. On Thursday evening, he ran a 4.47 40-yard dash, a 40-and-a-half-inch vertical jump, really strong numbers, and you know, it was a full-time starter this year. Will Anderson had moved on to the NFL, and teams love his athleticism, his production, and could be the first edge rusher off the board. Maybe could even slide into the top 10 of the NFL draft when it's all said and done. A few other SEC guys who wowed Ricky Parasol at Florida posted uh, crazy jumps with 42 inch vertical and a 10 foot nine in the broad jump. Here we're on a 4 4 1 uh, 40 yard dash. Edgerin Cooper, linebacker from AM, he ran a blazing fast 4 5 2 40 yard dash and had a really good yard, uh, 10 yard split. They like his uh, 34 inch arms as well on his frame. Uh, linebacker Trevin Wallace over Kentucky. He was one of the uh, more consistent guys, finished third in the 40-yard dash among linebackers and uh, former track star. So obviously showed off his speed very well. One guy who wowed a little bit, LSU D lineman Makai Wingo, significantly undersized playing that defensive tackle spot. The list him at six foot, but some people think he might be, even be a hair under that. Uh, six foot tall, 284 pounds, but he ran a 4.85 40-yard dash and had a 31 and a half inch vertical. They thought those were very impressive for a guy his size. Uh, Tennessee quarterback Joe Milton, he did not run the 40 yard dash, but he did put on a show with his arm. Uh, had a, his final throw went a whopping 73 and a half yards through the air. Pulled a lot of woos from the crowd, and um, he waited an extra second on the throw just to showcase his power throwing the ball down the field. So, no doubt, some NFL t- teams. May be attracted by Joe Milton's throwing ability. That was never his problem. I mean, chucking it downfield, but we know Joe Milton could do that. It was the other stuff he needed to, or still needs to, fine-tune. Uh, a couple other guys, uh, Lad McConkey. Uh, he left his mark at the Combine, Was uh, had a good senior bowl week, and then the 40-yard dash ran a 4-4-3, and then improved with the second run in a 4-3-9. Just a hair under six feet tall. Uh, did not. Look, he wasn't one of the fastest wide receivers, but they did say that uh, they were impressed with his speed and his stretch in the passing gauntlet received high marks for his balance, speed, and ability to hold his line. So uh, Lad McConkey helped himself. Who are some guys who maybe fell short of expectations? Well, Kentucky running back uh, Ray Davis, he just had an average 40-yard dash time and didn't really stand out in any of the athletic testing, but a lot of NFL scouts think he has a great frame for the NFL, showed good footwork through the bag drills, did step on one at one point, but um, they like him, but he didn't really do anything to help himself. Meanwhile, South Carolina quarterback Spencer Radler got a lot of buzz in February's performance at the Senior Bowl, but his athletic score at the Combine, not great. He ran a 4.95 40-yard dash, and a nine-foot broad jump. That ranked last among the five quarterback participants there in Indianapolis. Still thought of as probably a developmental quarterback, and uh, we'll see. Probably going to be one of those middle-round quarterbacks, but didn't do a whole lot to help him. And then another guy, very physical corner, Ennis Rakestraw coming out of Mizzou, but his athleticism was not uh, not the greatest showing. He ran a 4-5-1 40-yard dash. It's above average, but uh, 40 yard 40 yard time in the low four five is more than fine for his game, but the rest of his numbers were very average. Weighed in at just 183 pounds, tested as below average athlete in some of the advanced metrics, and uh, ran a sub uh, seven RAS. Um, so, look, if you want to dive deep into those, it's available for you out there. But uh, take that for what you will. I think uh, a lot of these SEC guys are. Going to go very high in the draft, and uh, look, it'll be another great year for SEC guys. Uh, 
getting selected by NFL teams and taking their game to the next level. All right, still more to come here on Locked On SEC, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, covering your team every day. Coming up next, we'll recap the weekend I was in SEC hoops and SEC baseball. That's coming your way here in just a sec. First, this episode presented to you by friends over at FanDuel. Look, go get your buckets on with your first bet over at FanDuel. They are America's number one sports book. And right now, new customers still getting that great deal. $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA teams and players over there at FanDuel. Of course, you get the big, um, you know, college basketball thing happening here in the next couple of weeks you want to make sure you're signed up and ready to go with FanDuel it is FanDuel.com slash locked on that's the website to go to get that special order again new customers if you never signed up with them before you're going to get that $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet uh, go check them out FanDuel.com slash locked on get signed up and then uh, download the app get it on your phone and super easy to log in every day and check out what they're offering you it is FanDuel they are the official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, roll along here. Locked on SEC. Thank you guys for making us your first listen every day. And it was a, a fun weekend of a lot going on around the uh, SEC sporting world. This is that busy time of year we got like gymnastics going on basketball is winding down only a couple of games left uh baseball's in full swing softball's in full swing but we figured we'd get you caught up with a couple of headlines and notes happening around the college basketball world when it comes to the sec in tennessee they have never made a final four program has earned a top four seed in the ncaa tournament nine times they've appeared in the ap top 10 at some point during 23 different seasons yet the school has advanced uh, to even uh, an Elite Eight only once, where they lost to Michigan State by a point. Was this the year Tennessee can get to the Final Four? Well, the Vols powered their way to the top of the conference this past week with a pair, over, a pair of wins over top 15 teams, including a win over Alabama on Saturday. The Vols came into that game tied with defending champion Alabama, top the league standings, and delivered their second straight big win heading into the final week of the regular season. Sakai Ziegler scored 18 points, made four three-pointers as number four Tennessee beat number 14 Alabama in Tuscaloosa, 81-74. to Everybody was on hand. Jalen Miller was there. Nick Saban was there. Uh, Kalen DeBoer was there. I mean, it was it was a star-studded event there in Tuscaloosa, and kudos to the Vols getting it done. That was a ma- massive, massive win for them. Uh, other games for the weekend, South Carolina beat Florida 82-76. to the Gamecocks now 24 and 5 overall, 12 and 4 in the conference. Michi Johnson had 25 points, including a go ahead three pointer. And the Gamecocks have a legit shot at coming away with an SEC title if they can beat Tennessee in the season's last home game. Uh, Florida, by the way, they tied for fourth in the SEC coming in. They had won nine of their past 11 and looked on their way to another win, but faded away late and let that one slip away. Meanwhile, Kentucky, uh, Rob Dillingham scored 11 of his 15 points in the final six and a half minutes, and Kentucky rallied for a 111-102 victory over Arkansas on Saturday at Rupp. Razorbacks led 86-77 to with eight and a half minutes to go, but John Calipari's group stormed back with a 21-6 burst to open up a six-point lead. Antonio Reeves led the Wildcats with 22 points. D.J. Wagner had 19, and Kentucky has now won five of their last six and three in a row. Other games from the weekend, LSU beat Vanderbilt on the road, 75-61. LSU is now 8-8 in the conference. Auburn took care of Mississippi State, 78-63. Auburn now 11-5 in the SEC. Texas A&M, they finally got a win, winning at Georgia, 72-56. Ole Miss got their 20th win of the year, beating Missouri, 84-78. Mizzou. Now a lowly 0-16 in the SEC. Crazy considering they made the tournament last year. And they are winless in the conference. So expect a few changes in Monday's latest AP Top 25 rankings. Like I said, Tennessee pulled ahead of Alabama for first place in the SEC championship race. South Carolina's comeback win over Florida. So the Vols and Gamecocks, they will battle it out Tuesday night in one of the season's featured SEC matchups with league title billing and NCAA tournament seating stakes on the line. 
Gamecocks, one win away from setting the program's all-time regular season record. Pretty impressive stuff. All right, let's switch gears before we uh, wrap it up here over on the Diamond, SEC baseball. Still very early in the year. Over Florida, Jack Caglione is living up to the hype in his junior season. On Sunday, he proved why he's one of the best, both on the mound and at the plate, as Florida beat Miami 8-4. to It was his first extended start of the year. Caglione went six scoreless innings, struck out a career high 11 batters against a really good Miami team. Only five Hurricanes reached base. And at the plate, he went three for five on the day and raised his average to 478 on the season. So Florida took two out of three at Miami over the weekend. Uh, LSU, they swept their tournament out in Houston at Minute Maid Park, picking up wins over Texas, Louisiana, and Texas State. Vanderbilt did the same thing out there in Houston. Uh, they had uh, came back to beat Louisiana, came back to beat Texas. They beat Houston. That Sunday game was crazy, and they came back to beat uh, the Longhorns 14-11. to uh, Texas A&M, they swept their tournament out in Dallas at Globe Life Field, beating Arizona State and USC. Big road trip for the Aggies this Tuesday out in Austin. Going to take on the Longhorns, who, by the way, Texas not in the SEC yet, but they lost all three of their games in that tournament in Houston. Uh, Tennessee, they swept Bowling Green. They improved 11-1 overall. Arkansas swept Murray State. Kentucky swept Lipscomb. They're now 10-1 and one overall. Ole Miss took two out of three against Iowa. Auburn took two out of three against UConn. Uh, South Carolina, they dropped their two games against Clemson. They were both close. I think they were both five to four. One of them was in extra innings. Uh, their first game of the weekend was postponed due to weather, so they only played two. Missouri, they dropped two out of three against Northern Kentucky. It's just going to be a rough year for Missouri in baseball. Georgia, they won two of their games against Georgia Tech. Their third game was halted due to rain, and Georgia was leading 9-3. to I was reading a report that said they may finish the game in Atlanta at some point later this season. So we'll see uh, Georgia very close to sweeping that series. Uh, and then Alabama, they played in a tournament out in Frisco, and they got some nice wins over the likes of Indiana and Arizona. Lost a tough one on Sunday to a really good Dallas Baptist team, but uh, – it's a good early showing overall for the SEC on the baseball diamond. So congrats to all the teams. We are getting oh so close. I think we're about two weeks away from SEC play starting up. So going to be a lot of fun to see what all those teams do. And, of course, only a couple games left in uh, SEC basketball as well. So a lot going on, and it's going to be a lot of fun to see how this whole thing finishes up. Thank you guys for making Locked on SEC your first listen every day. Shout out to everydayers. Come on back tomorrow on the show. Like I said, we'll have tons of stuff to get into. I was just looking at, we're going to be getting into uh, spring games, big storylines heading into spring. We'll be uh, getting into more on the, uh, there's been a lot of articles written on uh, projecting the most impactful SEC assistant coaching hires. So we'll run through that list. we got some updated Heisman Trophy candidate odds and uh, a list of 16 players set to emerge as the next wave of superstars in college football and some SEC guys on that list as well. So we'll get to all that stuff coming for you all this week. Make sure you're locked in. And subscribe to Locked On SEC, either in podcast form or the video form over on YouTube. Again, thank you guys for joining us. For your second listen, go check out Locked On's uh, Locked On Sports Today. It's 24-7. It's a streaming channel on YouTube. It's all the top sports stories of the day with our local experts from Locked On and our national shows covering every league. Again, for your second listen, go check out Locked On Sports Today on YouTube. I'm Chris Gordy. This has been Locked On SEC. We will talk to you guys tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody.